Hello and welcome to video six, where today we're going to be talking about input and output devices. So let's get straight to it. An input into our system is anything that can add information into our system. Once the information has been processed, then we output the information. So for your exam, you're going to need to know some examples of input and output devices. So for input, we've got things like keyboard, mice, microphones, scanners, graphics tablets, or even webcams. And these are all typically devices that add information into our system. So some examples of our output devices include our monitor, or sometimes we call it a visual display unit, printers, uh, plotters for graphics, projectors, speakers, or even headphones. So now let's talk about some specialist input devices. First, we've got the Optical Character Recognition, or OCR. And what this does is it converts printed media into editable text documents using a scanner. OCR is referred to as a post processing step. So this means after the document has been scanned, then the optical character recognition takes place. As the OCR reader scans the page, it performs something that we call pattern matching. The shapes that are scanned are very difficult for the computer to understand. What happens next is the shapes are compared to a database containing pre-existing characters. If the shapes match in the database, the system will add a digital version of the scanned character to your screen. If no match is found, then that shape is then skipped. Now this is quite easy for humans to read a piece of paper and understand what's going on, but this isn't very easy for computers. So optical character recognition will sometimes get things wrong. And this is why documents must be proofread. Next is optical mark recognition, and you may have seen this image before. This is a standard school register, and optical mark recognition is based around a predefined form. And there's no writing involved here. Everything is multiple choice, or the user is given an option, and they need to just select what they want. A special reader then scans the form. As you can see from this image, these predefined forms don't come without their errors and it's usually the human that makes the error. So what if two marks are made in the same selection? Then the reader will pick up the first mark on the sheet. And there's other problems associated with the reader. Sometimes the marks are outside the boxes or incorrect options have been filled in and you can't change them. And this is why these forms are quite unreliable and we don't tend to use them anymore. But with anything, we need to know about these for our exam. So I'm going to give you some examples to use. So if you get asked to give examples of optical mark recognition, you can use the multiple choice exams. Now, I have seen students just put exams down and they won't get the mark for that because it needs to say multiple choice. You can also use registers and even lottery tickets. And the final point to note here is that it's not suitable for any form of written communication. So you can't actually write anything. Everything must be predefined and selected. Moving on to magnetic ink character recognition or MIR. And sometimes you'll see it referred to as MICR. So don't get caught out by that. And we're talking mainly checks here because checks use ink containing iron oxide and iron oxide is magnetic the check will contain normal ink as well but as the reader scans the check it will pick up on only the iron oxide which means you can write over it but it doesn't matter it will still be read as normal now the reason it's almost exclusively used for checks is because of the sheer expense of the reader Next, we're going to talk about touch screens. And there's two types of touch screens that we need to be able to explain and describe in our exams. And there is no doubt in my mind that you have already used some of these touch screens before. As you can see from these images, touch screens are everywhere. And it allows the user to simply just press the options that they want on the screen. It saves these companies lots and lots of money because in retail, they don't need to pay expensive humans to actually take your order anymore or serve you. 
and mostly all smartphones on the market now have abandoned the old school keyboard technology and they've all moved to on-screen keyboards. So now let's take a general look at how touchscreens work. So touchscreens are laid out exactly like a grid. Each grid has an axis. When the user presses down on the screen, the grid position is recorded. And this can inform the system where the user has pressed. So let's have a look at how specifically resistive touchscreens record that press. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, resistive touchscreens are a bit outdated now. But they are still cheaper and they're made up of two thin transparent sheets. And because of this, the quality that you get from the screen is not as sharp as capacitive. Now, when the two sheets actually touch, a press is recorded. Now, pressure is needed, and that's where the name resistive comes from. Now, on to capacitive. And this is probably the screen that is inside your current mobile phone. It has a sharper image and multiple touch points. So that means you can touch using multiple fingers at the same time. It's a bit more expensive and it, it uses the fact that humans can conduct electricity. Problem is, if you use gloves or pens, it probably won't work on your screen unless you have specifically manufactured gloves or pens. Now we're gonna look at two other types of input using our voice. We've got voice input and vocabulary dictation. So firstly, starting off with voice input, this is my car. Now when I'm driving my car, uh, I can press a button and speak commands into it. However, the car only has a set number of spoken commands. So for example, I can call my mum, I can play Big Shack, or I can ask the car to take me home and it will plug that into the satellite navigation. Now that's great, but my car is limited. It cannot do everything. So with voice input, remember it uses a set command. Call, play, take me home, etc. So, vocabulary dictation, if we have a look at my phone here, I'm typing in by hand, hello, computer science people, and then I send it. Obviously, nobody doesn't exist in my phone, therefore, it gives me a, an error message. Now, when typing that, I made a few mistakes. Now, on your phone, you can use vocabulary dictation. So, I've pressed the little microphone button, and all I've said into the microphone is, hello, computer science people. It got it right first time, it was a lot faster, and it was a lot more efficient, it felt more natural. So now we're gonna look at the advantages and disadvantages of vocabulary dictation. So like we've just mentioned, it's faster than typing, and you don't need to learn how to type. All you need to do is speak into the microphone. You get less danger of repetitive strain injury because you're not hitting the keys all the time with your fingers, and it reduces the number of mistakes that you make. So the physical size of the keyboard takes up space, and this is especially apparent on your smartphone. If you had a keyboard, the size of your screen would be a lot smaller. Physically disabled users would find it much easier to use vocabulary dictation. Because you don't have to type means it's hands-free, which allows the user to multitask, and it's more natural to talk than it is to type. However, there are some negatives. The first one being background noise can interfere with vocabulary dictation and also users that suffer from speech impediments, sore throats, may have a cold or even having regional accents can pose a problem to vocabulary dictation. And also what if the user has a disability with their speech? This is obviously going to pose a problem. It's very hard to keep what you're saying private in the public domain using vocabulary dictation. And words that sound the same, such as two, two, and two, are going to confuse the system. And our final point today is voice print recognition. And this is the process of capturing a person's voice print, then digitizing and storing the data on a computer system. And it's usually used in high-level security systems, such as banks. So nowadays, HSBC are definitely using this because I bank with them and also high security room access.
The original data is compared with the new data and if they match, the access is granted. If not, then obviously access is denied. And that's all we need to talk about in input and output devices. I hope you've enjoyed this video and hopefully you'll join me for the next one.